Let's just imagine for a second that one of the biggest ice sheets on the entire planet disappears. What does that actually do to our coastlines, to our economies? Today, we're going to dig into what Greenland's melting really means for us, and maybe even more importantly, what it probably doesn't. Okay, so here's the big number you always hear, 23 feet. That's about seven meters. It's the amount the sea level could rise globally if every last bit of Greenland's ice melted. I mean, that's a staggering figure. And yeah, it definitely gets your attention. But you know, a huge number like that doesn't really tell the whole story. So we're gonna move past that headline. We're gonna look at what the science says is already happening, what's basically locked in for the near future, and what all of this means for businesses and infrastructure right now. So to really get a handle on where we're headed, we've got to start with a clear picture of the ice sheet today. You know, what's its current status? See, Greenland isn't just some big static block of ice. It's a massive critical part of our planet's whole climate system. And the balance is definitely tipping. It's losing ice faster and faster. And here's a little conversion rate you need to remember. For every 360 gigatons of ice that melts away, the global sea level goes up by about one millimeter. And that process, it's happening as we speak. And this melting, it isn't some far off abstract thing. It's already kicking off a very real economic ripple effect. We're talking about tangible consequences that we need to get our heads around now because they affect financial planning and how we value things today. To get there, we have to talk about this crucial idea called committed sea level rise. Think of it like this. You've slammed on the brakes of a massive freight train. It's slowing down, but it's still gonna travel a long way before it actually stops. This is the amount of sea level rise that's already baked into the system no matter what we do from this moment on. And just from Greenland alone, based only on the ice that we lost in a pretty short window from 2000 to 2019, we are already committed to about 0.9 feet of sea level rise. And let me be super clear, this isn't some guess about the future. It's a consequence that's already locked in thanks to our recent past. So what does nearly a foot of guaranteed sea level rise actually look like in the real world? Well, it means coastal real estate is in a much riskier position. That, in turn, makes insurance premiums shoot up. It means our ports need expensive fortifications. Our supply chains become way more fragile. And the long-term plans for things like offshore energy facilities, they have to be completely rethought. These are direct business impacts that just cascade from one to the next. And this is a really crucial point. The impact isn't the same everywhere. Now, this is gonna sound a little weird, but a huge ice sheet like Greenland has its own gravity. It literally pulls the ocean water towards it. So as it melts and loses mass, that gravitational pull gets weaker. And the water, it redistributes, kind of sloshing away. That means places far away, like the US East Coast, could actually see sea levels rise faster than the global average. Wild, right? Okay, so we've laid out the reality of the situation. Now it's just as important to talk about what won't happen. This is all about separating the hype and the scary headlines from the actual science. This is the big fear, right? The thing you see in disaster movies, that this enormous ice sheet could just suddenly give way. Look, here's the bottom line. While that 23-foot number is the total potential, it is absolutely not a forecast for our lifetimes or even our children's lifetimes. The sheer scale of this thing means a complete melt is a process that plays out over centuries, or more likely, millennia. It's a slow-motion problem, not an overnight catastrophe. And the other image we all have in our heads is this idea of a uniform wall of water just hitting every single coastline on the planet in the same way. But the reality is way more local and a lot more complicated. Just like we talked about with the East Coast, things like local geology, the infrastructure we've built, and yes, those weird gravitational effects, all create this complex patchwork of different outcomes. It's not one single event. Some areas will get hit hard, for sure, but others will be far more resilient. So if the problem is real, but it's not a sudden apocalypse, then the whole conversation has to shift. It's not about if we need to act anymore. It's about how we adapt in a smart, pragmatic, and strategic way. For any business or government, this really boils down to a clear four-step playbook. First, you have to assess the specific risk to your assets, whether it's a port, a factory, or a real estate portfolio. Step two, model what it would cost to adapt. Step three, actually invest proactively in resilient design. And finally, step four, you have to weave all of that into a bigger mitigation strategy. And the toolkit we have for this is actually pretty broad. 
You've got your hard defenses, sure, like seawalls and dikes. But there are also softer nature-based solutions, like restoring wetlands that act as amazing natural buffers. And it goes all the way to policy and finance, things like changing zoning laws or actually pricing the future cost of adaptation directly into an asset's value today. And this right here is a point we just cannot overstate. Adapting is absolutely essential, but mitigation, cutting emissions, is what buys us precious time. The slower the planet warms, the slower the ice melts, and the more time we have to put all these smart adaptation strategies into place. They're not two separate ideas. They are two sides of the very same coin. So where does all this leave us? Well, it leaves us with a pretty clear-eyed view of a very serious challenge. But, and this is the important part, it's one where we still have agency. So the big takeaway is this. This is not a sudden apocalypse. It's a process. And because it's a process, it's something we can model, we can plan for, and we can respond to. The key is to make smart, data-driven decisions, not just once, but continuously. And that leaves us with one final question. The physical reality of our world is changing. The challenge for us now isn't to panic. It's to make sure that our economic models, our infrastructure plans, and our business strategies are changing right along with it. 